Good morning. Today we're going to answer beginner beekeeping questions and there's no such thing as a silly question so ask away. We're here to answer any questions you have and help you get started in beekeeping. We're also here with Hallie, my niece, who's been beekeeping since you were how high? <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you've got questions for her you can also put them in the comments below. She's going to be harvesting a little honey as we go as we answer the questions. So um, ask away, Leah, our amazing customer support rep, is going to be reading out the questions and we'll answer them live as we go. So please don't be afraid to ask any questions, put them in the comments. Also really interesting to know whereabouts in the world you're tuning in from. We've got flow hives in 130 different countries and it's really fascinating to see where people uh, are writing from. So we do have some questions that have come in um, via, via email, so we'll get to answering them right away. Uh, Cedar, Jane lives in Stirling, Adelaide Hills, South Australia and has a really cold winter. Will it be too cold for the bees to thrive there? And what size hive should she get given the climate? Okay, so Adelaide Hills, for those that don't know Australia, is the more southern areas and it's, it does get a, a longer cold winter, certainly colder than here. So you wouldn't be harvesting honey in the winter time in the Adelaide Hills. As to the size of the hive, that's a good question, Jane. The uh, people in colder climates, or beekeepers in colder climates, often recommend the larger size. So we have this size, which is, is equivalent to a eight frame Langstroth hive which has eight brood frames in the bottom. Then we have a bigger size, which is the 10 frame size, so it has 10 frames. What that gives uh, the bees is a little more room to build up, a little more room to, to store honey, both in the, in the supers and in, in the edges of the brood box, which is, um, many beekeepers say, helps them last a long cold winter. So if you've got a long cold winter in your area, might be a good idea to get the larger size hive which we call a seven frame because flow frames are a bit wider and the seven flow frames in the larger 10 frame size Langstroth equivalent box. All a bit confusing but if you are confused just write in and we'll help you figure out what it is you need. Having said that I've been to Tasmania the most southern part of Australia here and you'll get one beekeeper who swears you need you need two 10 frame supers full of honey for the bees to survive the winter and then you go around the corner another commercial beekeeper saying no a setup like this with eight frames is fine so it's often dependent on the beekeepers in your area and the information in the end you'll have to listen and make up your own mind great question okay this is continuing on from jane's email um, we live on a one acre suburban block, plenty of natural vegetation and flowering plants. How far should we locate the bees from the house and could they create an issue for our neighbours? Okay, one acre is nice, that, that's great. You've got some got flowering plants and often in a suburban area you've actually got lots of flowers around the neighbourhood which actually keeps the bees going. A lot of variety actually helps your bees survive and, and some say bees actually do better in urban environments than out in the forest because the flowers tend to be more steady throughout the year. Um, in terms of locating your hive, we do have a video called Situating Your Hive, which covers the issues that you might need to consider, including the flight path of the bees from the entrance. You want to position it so the um, bees aren't going to be flying directly um, into where people walk. Having said that, we've put these right up against the fence. The bees are all doubling back and sometimes you get one accidentally flying into your hair, which does increase the um, chances of getting stings. So it's about thinking about where the bees are going to fly. Oh, lovely, some honey's just coming out. And, um, and how that's going to be for the people around and the neighbours. So, Nice idea to, to um, consider your neighbours and not point it at their washing line, etc., or at their path, so, um, especially if they, they might have some um, allergies to the bees. So it could be worth checking in about that. 
Um, David's asking, what's the closest you can have a flow hive to a house? The closest you can have a flow hive to a house is up to you really. Some people even put them on their balcony. Some people even put them inside with tunnels for the bees going up a tube and outside. Having said that, there can be issues where the bees will see the porch light. So if you've got a porch light shining that the bees can see, you get a few buzzing around at night, which can be an annoyance. So um, that, that could be one issue to consider, um, is just the proximity to lights and also the proximity to, um, to people as they move around. Um, Rachel's asking, her dad is allergic to bees. Um, her thought, she thought she could have a hive as far away from the house as possible. Do you think this would be okay? So there's people that get stung and they swell, which is relatively common. I swell a bit whenever I get stung. And then there's what's called anaphylaxis. Now anaphylaxis is serious. The, uh, people who have, have anaphylaxis issues, whether it be to stings or to nuts or whatever, is a really serious issue. We do have first aid information on our website. There's a link on the bottom of the pages for you to take a look at and please do. The, um, so it, it, the severity of, of the reaction from your father will be something to consider. Having beehives around does increase the likelihood of stings. The, um, so if, if, if you do decide to go ahead, then you'll need to take that into consideration and you'll be wanting to keep them well away um, from the house if you can. Um, so Rachel's location has a lot of trees. Is a hive best suited in a shady location or out in the sunlight? Bottom slide, bottom slide. No, it's oh yeah, not okay. Not. Cool. All right. Sorry? <laughs> Rachel's location has a lot of trees. Is a hive best suited in a shady location or out in the sunlight? Shady location or out in the sunlight. Bees will thrive in both full sun and also in shade. Having said that, shade um, is said to um, be more likely to get what's called chalk brood, which is a, a, um, a disease that can get into hives. It's not a, not a major one, but um, shade is said to provide the environment where that can, can thrive in the hive um, more so. So a little bit of sun is good if you can get it. Having said that, if you've got no choice, then you can still keep bees in the shade. The best I find if you're in a climate like this, which does have a lot of sun, is morning sun and, and uh, afternoon shade. So especially in summer, or even better if you, if you can position them on the side of a tree where they get some winter sun, but summer shade, that's even better. Having said that, sun or shade is okay for bees. Um, Kent's asking, is there a drawback to using foundation in the brood box? Why do you recommend foundationless? Okay, so what I was talking about here, if you come and have a look at these frames, the, the brood box here, is full of frames which basically are the same as beekeeping has been done for hundreds of years. And what um, he's talking about is foundationless, which is where you just give the bees a little starter strip here, a guide to hang their natural comb off. And they'll hang their comb like this in a nice arch and then eventually they'll fill it out to the edges. Now that's what I like to do for a few reasons. One is you don't have to go through the process of waxing and wiring your frame. So when I grew up, we always used wax and wire in our frames like this. Now what you have to do to put it in is first you have to thread all that wire through, get it nice and tight. Then you need to connect the ends to a, a car battery to heat up the wires and melt the foundation on to those wires. Now that's a typical wax and wire frame then, and it does work quite nicely. However, it's actually a lot of work to do that, and what you're giving the bees is a specific cell size to start on. And I believe it's better to let the bees naturally size their comb themselves, let them 
build their comb perfectly naturally in the brood box and that has then health benefits for the bees because the, uh, the cell size is said to affect the bees health if they can have it the right size for their genetics. So there's a few reasons there. Having said that, it's a little bit more work in the hive if the bees go wonky. So it's easier in the beginning. All you have to do is put that stick in the top, put your frames into the brood box, make sure they're all in there, squeeze them nice and tight in the middle, putting space on either edge and the bees will draw their comb. But it is up to you. Beekeepers will suggest uh, all different things and if you've got someone helping you, sometimes it's good to try some things that they suggest and find out for yourself. There's other, um, there's other types too. You can put a plastic foundation sheet. It's very common to put a plastic foundation sheet that slots right into the slot here and into the slot there when you construct your frame together. And then to take it a step further, there's frames like this, which are a complete plastic frame with foundation moulded into it. I've used all of these methods a lot and my favourite is to let the bees draw it themselves for both their health and ease. But you will need to get in there and make sure they're going straight so that's the drawback but I find that fun when the bees are first starting out it's really interesting to get in there and look and see how they're making their comb, check that the queen's laying and so on. Um, Andrew's in the Hawkesbury in New South Wales and has a very, very full flow hive at the moment. He was contemplating splitting the hive to stop them swarming, but has re been reminded not to do it in winter as there will not be many, if any, drones to fertilise the new queen. When would you recommend looking to split it? Any uh, opinions would be helpful. Okay, great question. So Hawkesbury, that's um, a little bit cooler than here, but still still um, a fairly warm climate. If your beehive's really full at the moment, that's a really good sign to come. And yes, good idea to think about um, swarm management. If you do nothing, they may swarm this spring, in which case you'll either have to catch the swarm or if you're not around, you might lose half your bees and that'll slow your, your colony down. So a better idea, as you say, might be to split your hive. So that involves taking some of the frames out of this brood box and put, putting them into a new hive, either introducing a new queen or letting them raise their, their own naturally. And we've got videos on, on going either way with that. Um, I would recommend uh, waiting till springs a little bit further down the road to do your split. So another month perhaps. Spring does come early here where we are and it probably is the same in Hawkesbury. Um, so if it was me, I'd probably look at doing that in August. Good question. Um, is it hard to catch a swarm? So Hallie's, um, she's caught a few swarms. My nephew Hallie has grown up doing a bit of beekeeping and also watching us invent the, the flow hive. We were in her house uh, with a beehive on the kitchen bench. Um, with bees in it and if you if you have a look at our original promo video Hallie was harvesting honey in her kitchen on the toast. So um, what's it like catching swarms? Um, well the first time I caught a swarm I was actually down feeding my horses and I heard the bees and it was very loud and I looked up and I saw this huge thing just huge clump of bees and I ran up and I got dad and we got out the ladder and what actually happened was Dad was underneath the beehive and I climbed up on the ladder. I was balancing so carefully and I shook them all over Dad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was the fun part. But it was, it was tricky once he got there because then I had to take it out of his hands and it was a bit, um, bit fiddly. But it, it was pretty easy because the bees are pretty nice when they're swarming. They're not too um, stingy. How old were you at the time? I think I was eight or nine. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And did, how did the bees go? Um, I don't think anyone got any stings. Or oh, in terms of the, did the, the bees fill up the brood box and create some honey? Yeah. Yeah. I still have that hive now. So that's like sort of my hive that I get to harvest from. That's pretty nice. Fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so we do have videos on catching swarms and how you do that if you do want to look in. 
Look at that, yum. I'm going to have to taste the honey. And also videos on how to harvest the honey in, in this way. And any way you want to keep bees is fantastic. It's just good to look after our bees. And if you do look after them, you get rewarded with the amazing golden honey. Cedar, Edgar lives somewhere where it gets to minus 35 degrees Celsius. Can he still have a hive? Okay, minus 35 degrees Celsius is cold. Now, having said that, we do have flow hives in Nebraska. We do have flow hives in Michigan. There is flow hives even in Norway. So what you find is the winter management will become crucial to get your colony through the winter. But in the summertime, you get a lot of flowers all at once and it can be really exciting. Canada also, lots of flow hives in Canada. And, and what you'll find is is the season gets compressed into a shorter amount of time and if you've got your bees thriving in, in spring then they can bring in honey in a really exciting way. We've got people that I know in Canada who say they've seen a whole box to be filled in 24 hours which is extremely hard to believe. I've only ever seen it in a week here. So um, Beekeeping in colder climates can be really exciting, but it's very seasonal compared to here where we've got sort of a gentle honey flow all year round, peaks in spring, and the rest of the time it ebbs and flows. So it's, you will need to find a little bit out from your local beekeepers about how to do that um, winter management that they call overwintering. Oh, we've just had a little message come in from Tommy. I've got two of your hives in Alaska. They've provided everything I hoped for. Thank you for the great invention. Me and my neighbours, thank you for the impact you've made. Amazing, that's incredible. Thank you for um, reaching out and, and um, tuning in. Um, Danny's been trying to find out how to tell workers and drones apart. Any tips? So workers and drones are probably a lot easier to tell apart than the workers and the queen. So drones are a bigger bee. They're, they're um, more um, rounded in body shape. And the, the, the key to it is the eyes are bigger and touch in the middle. So that's one thing to look out for when you're looking in your brood box. The drones are bigger and rounder and their eyes touch in the middle at the front. So the queen, however, that is actually a worker bee that's, that's genetics have changed by um, continuing to feed her royal jelly throughout her gestation. And she simply gets bigger legs and a longer abdomen. And so she can be much more easily confused for, for a worker bee. Um, Philip would like to know how many litres of honey can a frame hold? So a, f a flow frame holds two litres of honey. So Hallie's just filling up jars there and we'll get about two litres worth which is approximately three kilograms of, of honey because honey is heavier than water. It's incredible actually that out of one frame you can get so much honey and, and you can have a hive in your backyard and get plenty of honey to share around with your neighbours which is often a great thing especially if you're trying to uh, sweeten up your neighbours should they be a little bit worried about having bees around. Um, Dane's asked, isn't plastic bad? So plastic's a really interesting question and I think that we do have quite a issue with plastic in our world and I'll be one of the first ones to say we should be getting rid of single-use plastics because they're clogging up our waterways, they're clogging up our oceans, they're they're, they're wreaking havoc to our marine life. There's just so much single-use plastic. Having said that, plastic is an amazing material. You can mould it into all sorts of shapes. It's strong, it's light, and if used correctly, it can be very useful and provide what one would say is almost a more natural experience of harvesting honey because you can sit here with your family and the honey flows right out of your hive. So there's all sorts of things in our life that plastic is extremely useful, but I do believe one-use plastics should be 
stopped for sure. Then there's the issues of there's a lot of plastics that are known to have toxins. So in choosing the plastics for the flow frames, we made sure we were choosing the very best available food grade plastics. So then the, what happens is the bees cover them all in wax so your honey is actually sitting inside eventually a wax pocket with inside the um, partially made flow frame and then the bees can complete the cell with their wax also. So um, you can, if you're worried about plastic, you can take some comfort that the honey will still be encapsulated in beeswax as your flow frames get more waxy. And you can see it there. You can see the wax build up in the windows here, lining the cells. And over time, that gets thicker and thicker. Um, so great question. Ryan would like to know, what do you think about cannabis honey that bees pollinate from the cannabis buds? So I don't know a whole lot about that, but um, as far as I know, um, it's more of a wind pollinated plant. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but if you, if you need some information, you can put it in the comments below. Um, Alexia is in the tropics in Darwin. Will a flow hive work there? Absolutely. So the tropics is a great place to keep bees. You probably do want to keep them in shade. It's a very hot climate, but what you get is often a year round honey flow. And the only thing that slows it down is the wet season where it's just too rainy to forage. So it can be a, a very exciting, you get lots of rainforest flavors, lots of tropical flavors. And, and here we're in the subtropics. So it's just a step up for here from here with, um, flowering things all year round, which is fantastic for bees and all the pollinators. Chloe's asking, is it an issue to have bees when I have a young child and a dog? Okay, so children and hives, obviously you probably see some footage with my children around the hives. And it's a case of you getting comfortable with your hives first. So hives, like dogs, can have different temperaments and some you wouldn't put your children in close proximity or, or there could be issues and others you can. This particular hive here, uh, you can actually pull apart this hive without any bee suit at all. But if I went down to this hive here, then I wouldn't do that because I know that hive has a more aggressive tendency. So as you get more comfortable as a beekeeper, you can then make the decision how close you want your children around the hive. Glenn would like to know, do you f need to fix the top half, so the super, to the brood box? He has a hive with no bees yet, but thinks the top would just blow off in the wind. I, I agree that that's the way it looks. You get a hive and go, how come? This is, this is so ridiculously slippery. It's just going to slide off. But this is one without any bees in it. And as soon as the bees get in there, they quite quickly actually join it all together, so much so that you actually have to lever it apart with your hive tool to get the boxes apart. So the bees do a really good job of gluing it all together and there's really not a, a need for um, fastening the boxes together unless you're transporting them, in which case you want to take the lid off and put a strap completely around the hive before you um, go to transport it. Now, having said that, some people do like to get those toggle latches and put them on their hive and latch the boxes together. With the Flow Hive 2, we, um, because we do get some very strong winds here and some of our customers also do get strong winds, you can uh, then twiddle these little roof latch screws and that'll tighten the roof onto the box because the roof doesn't have the bees in it if you've got your cap inside and the wind can get under these edges and start to lift it. So so generally we find that the setups um, quite quite okay like that. Jamie is asking can you show the front of the hive the one that we're harvesting um, do you normally see a lot of bees hanging out the front? Okay let's have a look so if your hive was really um, full of bees, you do get a situation where bees will move out of the way to make room to start repairing all those flow frame cells 
and starting that whole process again. But here you can see there's, there's really not a whole lot of activity. It's winter time here and the bees are a bit slow in the morning. They should get going as the day goes on. But the, the bees here really haven't noticed a whole lot. Here, this is the frame we're actually harvesting. If you have a look at this, this um, frame here is the one that we're harvesting. And um, the, it, the bees are kind of just going about their, their normal work. So that's what we envisage when we spend a decade, my father and I, trying to hone the, uh, the process of being able to harvest honey in such a simple, gentle way. And there's a perfect example of it where the capping is staying in place. There's a couple of spots where it's ripped a little bit, which is a good thing because the bees then get in there a bit quicker, start tearing that capping off, waxing up all the cells, putting the nectar in and starting that whole process again. So as you can see, the bees have hardly noticed what's going on. Some of them have noticed the honey's disappearing beneath their feet and they're starting to, to chew away at the wax and start that that process and it's actually um, such a pleasure to watch the honey pour straight out of the hive while the bees are going about their, their business. Having said that you just still do need to pull apart your hive to service your brood nest periodically and the requirements for that do differ in, in which location you're in. So here in Australia commercial beekeepers will make sure they do a full brood inspection a couple of times a year to make sure pests and diseases uh, aren't present at damaging levels in their hives. Other continents where you've got the varroa mite during the, um, the, the, uh, the warmer months you may need to get into your brood nest and check for varroa depending on your varroa treatment strategies. So there's a bit of, bit of learning to do there if you're in one of the other continents, America, Europe, New Zealand, everywhere except Australia has the varroa and it's a little bit more maintenance um, and I hope we don't get that here. Andre would like to know, can you transport your flow hive? You can transport your flow hive and it's something that I've done a reasonable amount of moving hives around, around the area. So if you were to transport to a flow hive as it is here, what you'd need to do is take the lid off, make sure your plug's in the inner cover inside. And um, you can see that here. I'll just take off this roof. I'm not sure if I've got a cap in there. There we go. So you want to make sure that's in. If you've got one of our earlier designs without that piece, you'll just need to cover that so the bees can't get out. So you, you want to prepare in the daytime prepare your hive by covering that and putting a good strap around it. Then you want to come along in the night. Generally home beekeepers choose to block the entrance for transport. So what you'll need to do is add a whiff of smoke so any remaining bees on the outside will, will go in, seize the moment when all the bees are in and block the entrance with something. You can use uh, a steel wool or, or, or you could um, tape something across the entrance. Now the um, the next issue is uh, lifting it, which you'll need to get some help because beehives can be quite heavy, especially if they're full of honey. And then you'll need to strap it down. Now, if you've got our leg kit, wind the feet all the way up on all sides so it's nice and level and stable. Then you'll need to strap that down on your trailer or the back of your, your um, truck. So, so um, that's really the process. And we do have a video showing you how to do that if you plan to move your hive. If you're going to move them a, um, a long distance, then you can just move them and open the entrance when you get to the other end. Generally, you'll be moving them at night time, or if it's a cool day, you could block them up just before sunlight and move them in the morning. But you want to avoid moving them in the heat of the day if you can. Ventilation is another issue with moving a hive, and we've got a nice screen bottom board. so you would either take the tray out completely to heaps of ventilation or, or perhaps um, just spin this around so the air can travel in these vents and up under the screen bottom board there. So this has two positions for, for no ventilation or ventilation if the vents are at the top side. So 
We do have a video on moving your hive if you need to do that. If you're moving them a short distance, you can either just creep them a um, metre by metre, move them a metre in the morning and a metre in the afternoon, and the bees will follow. Um, if you need to move them, say, um, 100 metres over there, you might choose to just move them in, in one hit and then, and then put some obstacles in front of the entrance to, to stimulate the bees to reorientate to the new spot. And that's a little trick you can do there. And we've got another video on how to do that. Kim's in Scottsdale, Arizona, and it's very hot. Is there a maximum heat that the hive can handle? So we do have flow hives in Arizona. So in the really hot times, shade is going to be a key if you can get it. Having said that, bees are incredible air conditioning. <laughs> They've got incredible air conditioning talents. They, they will actually bring water to the hive and fan it to get evaporative cooling and keep their hive at a temperature that, that wax um, won't melt out and the brood won't die out. So they need to keep the, the brood box at around 35 degrees Celsius and the, the um, honey super they'll let get a bit hotter in those hot times. I've measured 40 degrees um, at the top of a beehive when we've had um, temperature probes in there. Um, having said that, I have had some friends in Melbourne when they had a heat wave, 40 plus degrees, they had their hives on the roof of their building, which made it even hotter because of the sun hitting the, the roofing iron. And they had an issue where the hives melted down. So in here, wax melting temperature is 63 degrees. The wax melted, the, 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 um, it all dribbled right through, down through the roof and somehow through the ceiling, down the light fitting, and onto the kitchen table. So all of a sudden they were like, what's going on? We've got honey dripping <laughs> on the kitchen table, but it wasn't a funny matter. The beehives had had a total meltdown. So in a really hot climate, I wouldn't keep bees on the roof. I'd put them on an area that's got a bit of um, uh, stabilizing, like the grass, which will help moderate the temperature. Okay, we have a lot of questions that have come in. Okay, we've got lots and lots of questions, which is fantastic. I'll keep answering them. Um, Perdetza said that she believes that she will have trouble putting the hive together. Will she need a carpenter? Okay, if you have trouble putting the hive together, get some help. People often like um, putting the screws in and helping put your hive together. We've tried to make it as easy as possible by including um, the, the square drive that you can, with this softer western red cedar wood, you can actually put it in by hand. However, you'll probably not do the whole thing at once if you're putting it in by hand because it will take you a while. A drill is better, so you might want to get a friend with a drill to help you put the, um, the screws in. We've got videos showing you how to put it together and people often enjoy the experience, but, but if you're not comfortable, then for sure, get some help. Neil's asking, how do flow hives handle high winds? Are they heavy enough not to get blown over? So here down the front, you can see we've got a whole lot of hives right on the edge of the hill, which is great for, for a beautiful view. But we do get extreme winds coming up that slope almost underneath the hive, and we do get We've, we've had 90 kilometre an hour winds coming up that slope and what we find is the flow hive classic without the roof locks uh, tended to, to the, the roofs would blow off at that time so we, if you're in that situation you could put a tie over your hive in order to keep your roof down. If you've got the flow hive too generally it's not a an issue even in those extreme winds however if you've got cyclonic winds then you could put a tie down uh, a rope down to the some some heavier weights on the ground but these roof latches will help um, tie your hive on tie your roof on in those strong uh, wind times the box is usually well glued together by the bees and the, there's not usually a, an issue there and the surface area doesn't have these um, areas to catch the wind so they um, seem to be fine in strong winds Glenn has bees in the wall of his house and would like to re relocate them into his flow hive, 
but they seem extremely aggressive. Should yeah. he exterminate them or, and buy a more passive hive? Okay. Um, getting bees out of a wall is a tricky process and I've done it before a few times and there's a, there's a few methods. You can either pull your whole wall apart if that's a possibility and then cut out the sections of brood comb and rubber band them into the frames or use some skewers through the holes in the side to hold those pieces into the frames and you can get a, a good colony in your hive that way. There are some other techniques by making like a one-way bee valve where you make a cone of mesh and put your box right up against that for the bees to go into and the bees get all stuck on the outside and start to move in here. If you put a frame of brood from another hive in there that'll even help again. Eventually the queen may come out and, and join the colony on the outside and no bees can get back into the wall if they've got that one-way valve made out of a cone of mesh. I've also used a technique with a flea collar, which um, my brother actually taught me because he's, a, he's an arborist and to get bees out of a tree hollow if they have to cut down the tree, you can put a flea collar in there. It doesn't kill the bees but it annoys them enough to relocate after a month or two. It worked for me getting them out of one wall just by making some little incisions, putting the flea collars in. About six weeks later, the bees um, absconded. Now, I almost caught them, but I missed them at times. So you'll have to weigh up your pros and cons. Hilary Kearney does a lot of wall cutouts, so you might find some good information from her about how to go about it. As to the aggression of the hive, the, um, it is nice to, to get the hive, and it also is nice to have a gentle hive to work with. So if you do go through the process and you find they're still aggressive in your hive, you might uh, want to change the queen by introducing a new one and get some new genetics that will then, then um, uh, provide uh, nice gentle worker bees as time goes on. Ray's asking, after harvesting, how do you clean the flow frames instead of leaving things out for the bees to clean up? Okay, good question. It's um, not a good idea to leave honey out for bees to clean up because what it does is gets them a taste for nectar and it gets them a taste for honey instead of nectar. So the bees will, will then start looking for honey in other hives instead of flowers and then you get what's called robbing where the bees will start robbing each other and weaker colonies can get decimated and actually die out from other hives robbing them. So in some states it's actually illegal to feed bees honey in the open so um, do be mindful of that. If you want the bees to, let's say you're planning to take the flow super off and put it away for the winter. Now a little trick you can do is, um, is harvest the honey, leave, you can leave the frames in open position and the bees will tear off the cappings, suck out any, any remaining honey and leave it dry. Now, having said that, I wouldn't do that if, the, um, if there's not much honey in them because what you'll find is um, there'll be a whole lot of bees down all the cells when you're trying to harvest, which is a bit of a disturbance to them. So, um, but yeah, if you've got full flow frames and you do want to take them off, then you can harvest them all, leave them open for perhaps um, two days for the bees to, to clean them up and then you can put them away dry for the winter. Another option is you can just wash the honey out. So if you've got a, um, a strong hose, you could wash all the honey out, let them dry, then put them away. Another option is you can put them in the freezer or if you live in a cold climate, then it will be naturally cold and you can just leave the remaining honey in the frames and put it back on in the springtime. There's a few options there depending on, on what you want to do. Here we can leave the, the uh, flow frames on all year round so it's not such a, an issue for us. If we do leave flow frames, so we're often shuffling things around for all sorts of reasons, if we do leave some flow frames around and they start to get a bit uh, manky then, then um, you've got two choices. One is to wash it, dry it, put it back on 
or, or if, if it ha hasn't been too long and the honey in it's still okay, you can put it back on the hive for the bees to clean up and they're very good at cleaning their, their comb surfaces once it's in the hive. Justin's in Newcastle and last summer he added a second brood box to his hive to help manage swarming. Um, he's also purchased a three frame hybrid super that he plans to add on top of his current setup. His question is, is this too much for one hive and how can he manage swarming with this setup come spring? Okay, the answer is it's not too much for one hive. However, if the bee numbers drop and there's not enough bees to really fill all of the comb areas, let's say they, they do happen to swarm despite your efforts to stop that, and they uh, then um, you've got thin bee numbers on the comb surfaces when you open the windows, not many bees, then you'll want to be taking one of those boxes off. Reason being is, is pests like hive beetles, the small hive beetle will take over a hive if there's not a whole lot of bees to, to manage all of the surfaces. So um, certainly I've got, there's a hive there with an extra box on it and it's doing fine and a lot of beekeepers do like to add another box. If you are adding another box I'd wait till the first box is, is um, mostly full before you do that. If you add two boxes straight away it's just too much space and you'll get a bit impatient with not much activity in your flow frames. What you want ideally is lots of bees and a good nectar flow and the bees will, will fill up those frames quite quickly. If you want to add another box you can go ahead and do that. In the Newcastle area you could go either way. I myself would probably tend to just split the hive if it was strong, get another hive going and keep it more or less in this format with a single brood box and a, and a single super. But it depends what you want to do. So you can, you can go upwards if you want. Some countries they go 10 boxes high. They harvest honey in conventional ways. They're ripping off honey boxes, standing on ladders, honey dripping all over their heads. And you know, it becomes a lot to manage then when you've got 10 boxes high. Danny's asking, is it best to start beekeeping in the spring um, since they're halfway through the summer and there aren't many flowers flowering right now? Okay, so the, if you're in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere now, which you'll be, then it the, depends if you're in the, the Southern States, then there's a much longer season and you could still start now, but do ask your local beekeepers. If you're in the Northern areas, then you might find you're just getting your colony started and then the winter comes. So, so it could be um, a good idea to wait for spring or purchase a hive that's already full of bees and then swap it into a flow hive and then you can, you can um, get them filling the flow frames during the, um, the rest of the, the summertime honey flow. In the southern hemisphere here, spring's just around the corner. Um, perfect time to, to put in your orders with getting some bees and put in your orders with your, your hive your flow hives to, to get them going or whatever beehive you choose to keep bees in. Troy's asking how many litres should you leave for the bees over winter? So that depends. This area the answer is we don't need to leave any because we get a general honey flow through the winter. In the, the southern areas of Australia one beekeeper will tell you you need to leave two boxes of honey for them to survive the winter and another will say no one's enough so you need to make up your your mind about that if you find you've got very little honey stores and it's winter the be or the winter's coming the best thing to do is actually feed your bees and we've got another another video on how to do that and uh, build up some stores for them to survive the winter you don't want your bees to starve. Now, if um, if it's midwinter and and there's no more honey in your hive, or, or you know it's getting very lightweight if you if you lift it, because um, you probably don't want to be pulling apart your hive too much in the in the winter time. Um, then it it can be get it can be hard to get them to take the uh, 
the feed or the sugar syrup once it's already winter. So ideally you feed it beforehand, but if you've got no other choice, then still try to feed them in, in the winter to help them get through. Would you like to do a few more questions? Yeah, we might as well keep going. There's so many great questions. If you put them in the comments below, we'll also keep answering them on the computer after this call. Ray is in New Jersey and looking to get the seven frame flow hive and an Appy May insulated one for comparison. Can he get a flow hive super to fit it? Okay, we do have some people actually locally um, who have put um, flow frames into Appy May hives. Now, the, what you'll need to do is modify the back panel. So if you see what we've done here, you need to cut some wood out to fit the Appy May shape. So that bit you'll need to create yourself if you choose to do that and put flow frames into the Appy May uh, plastic hive. Um, Simon, <laughs> Simon is in the central coast of New South Wales and is excited to get bees in spring currently. His hive is a feature piece of furniture in his lounge room. <laughs> okay, fantastic. It's a good time to, to get your orders in, get the bees going. It's a fascinating learning journey and it's a lot of fun for the whole family. Greg's wondering how many hives he can place around 80 acres of cattle grazing fields with rural housing and soybean fields nearby. Okay, so um, the maximum I've heard commercial beekeepers keeping bees in one location is usually about 100 hives. Beekeepers around here in commercial apiaries tend to use about 40 to 50 in one apiary. So the, um, the issue, once you get to those levels, then your, your bees are, are starting to compete for forage, I guess. But the, the issue on the smaller scale is more so whether there's flowers or not. When there's flowers, there's heaps, there's nectar dripping to the ground, there's, there's, there's more than enough for all of your, your bees to, to get out there, even if you have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 hives. Um, but then there'll be times when there's nothing. So keeping um, a lot of hives means that um, you'll, you'll need to manage those times if the bees do get hungry in your area. Um, Brad's asking, how important is it to reduce your boxes from two to one in winter? Um, Brad's in Sydney and did an inspection. Lots of bees in the brood box, but not too many in the super. Okay, so um, in that area, I would probably just leave it as, um, I'd leave the super on, unless your colony is really weak and there's really none up in the super and the colony is actually struggling. Sometimes you get a, a queen that's weak and your, your hive is struggling for whatever reason and, and um, or, you know, for or pests or disease reasons and you'll actually need to get in there and fix that. Um, but if, if your colony is still healthy, they've filled out all the brood frames, there's still some bees going up into the super, I'd probably leave it as is in your area. Chuck would like to know, do the bees recycle any of the capping wax they remove after a harvest? That's a great question and even very experienced beekeepers get confused by that because it's, it wasn't a, so much common knowledge that the bees recycle the wax throughout the hive. Now what, what we did, because we did so many experiments over a decade of work, was there was a lot of times we were trying to remove the capping inside the hive which which involved much more complex arrangements of diaphragms and, and suction and, and things. And um, only to realize that we didn't need to remove the capping, the bees would chew that capping away and actually reuse it, which is a beneficial thing. So what happens when you harvest a flow frame, and you can have a look in the window here, and we've probably got some bees just starting to, um, to chew that wax capping away. So. You'll see here, there's, there's, there's one bee with its head down a cell, there's another one over here chewing a little bit, and um, the bees will certainly recycle that. So if you're wanting to hurry up the bees to start working on the flow frames, which, 
which um, if you haven't got a strong nectar flow or a strong colony can take them some time to um, start, start uh, waxing up the flow frames. You can actually get wax from down in your brood box if you scrape off some burr comb, press it into the flow frame surface and the bees will recycle it and redistribute it. You can watch them through the window as they use that wax to join the parts of the flow frames together. So um, it's a very clear um, answer to yes, they do recycle the wax. Joey's concerned that it will be too cold in Denver, Colorado for a flow hive. Okay, so we haven't found any major issues with cold climates. There's a bit more to do for overwintering and we, we had someone tune in before saying they had uh, flow hives in Alaska working perfectly and, and producing lots of honey in the, in the summertime. So, We've got flow hives in Canada, flow hives in Michigan, flow hives in Nebraska, and um, it's it's um, bees are a European bee. They've they've evolved very cold climate. You can dig them out of the snow come come the uh, the spring, and and if your bees have had enough honey in your hive, most of the time they'll survive that. Brad has lots of small hive beetle in his hive. He's found that filling up the bottom tray takes a lot of oil. Any other strategies for keeping them at bay? Okay, so you don't need to completely fill your bottom tray. So uh, what um, he's talking about there is here, you can use this tray for catching beetles by putting some oil in here. We'll put some baffles in it so you don't need to fill it completely up. as just a little bit in each area. I have the benefit of collecting old fish and chip shop oil because I run my car on old veggie oil from the chip shop, so I've got plenty of, of old cooking oil, but you can use it after you've done some deep frying in your kitchen if you don't want to waste oil, or you should find that um, uh, 500 mils would be enough to just cover, all you need to do is cover these areas and that's enough to trap beetles. Having said that, there is other methods that you could try, you could try um, fluffy um, like uh, a ch the back of, of restaurant tablecloths. It's a fabric you can get from a textile store and the, the, the um, bees can get their, sorry, the beetles can get their legs tangled in it and then they'll die in that, excuse me. <coughs> um, so the, there is a few other methods. You can also use, um, uh, I think some people are using diatomaceous earth. Sometimes some rain gets in here though that turns into a bit of a mess. I find oil a more useful tactic if you've got a beetle problem you need to get on top of. Um, Peter Cox, our flow hive ambassador in South Australia, just wanted to let us know that he's running a winter workshop in Lewiston in August. Okay, great, a winter workshop, it's a good time. Nice one, Peter. It, to, to get out there and um, get educated about your beekeeping so you can really hit it, hit the ground running in spring. So um, some people choose to do a bee course, great thing to do if you want to get out there and experience it before getting bees. Other people just jump in, order their hives, what, learn what they can online, get help from a friend when they need it and that's a, another valid way to start your learning journey and it depends where you are. Some people like to do a lot of education and others like to um, learn as they go. If you can, there's a workshop in your area, check out Peter's workshop and, uh, and he'll, he'll um, show you all about looking after your bees in your brood box and, and how to go about harvesting your flow frames, etc. Got time for two more questions. Um, Chuck would like to know, how do you get granulated honey out of the flow frames? Okay, granulated honey is an interesting question. It's one we got a lot in the beginning with a lot of beekeepers going, what's going to happen with granulated honey? The answer is, it's the same as any, any beekeeping. If you've got granulated honey in the frames, it's going to be hard to get out. And what tends to happen with the flow hive is because you're leaving the box on, you're less likely to get uh, the candying it's called or the sugar crystals forming because it, the bees are keeping the hive warm. Having said that I have seen it where you've got partial um, sugar crystals, the sugar crystals stay in the cells and the liquid honey drains out. The, um, 
If you are in a situation where, let's say, you've got a specific type of flower, canola is one of them. Canola, if you take a box off and take it to your shed, leave it overnight, the whole lot goes candied and uh, then it's really hard to extract. So commercial beekeepers will keep their, their uh, honey supers warm to stop that from happening. We're harvesting on the hive, so you could, you'd probably find that you can just harvest your canola honey directly before it candies. But let's say you left it on over winter, the edge frames get a bit cooler. Some of your frames, and I've done experiments on purpose to get it candied in the frames to see what happens, and I put those candy frames back in. Uh, and what tends to happen is you attempt to harvest, and and what happens then is you, is you get a little bit of um, dislodging, but no honey coming out obviously because it's set like hard crystals. And but that stimulates the bees to start chewing away the capping and fixing that up. And then the next time, it's likely that they'll be foraging on something else and filling it with nectar. So that, that's that's one thing to do is just let the bees eat away the sugar crystals and then fill it with liquid honey again. One more question. John is asking how many times can you harvest honey before you need to replace the flow frames? Okay, that's a great question. My answer is hopefully for many, many years. We've had flow frames now in, in our apiary going on um, well, the pre-production models, so well before we launched, we've now had them there for four years, so so four, five, six, seven years, and and we're still finding we're 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 good. Now um, it's a new technology. My father and I invented. Having said that, if you do have any problems, we will look after you. So if you, if you find any issues whatsoever with your flow frames, just write to us, and we'll make sure you're looked after. Thank you very much for tuning in and thanks to Hallie for harvesting the honey and telling your swarm catching story. Tune in again next week and we'll be showing you something interesting.